Is the Australian housing market about to crash? So you'll remember from my last video where I mentioned that I was going to do a video on my views of the housing market. Now, it's taken me a bit of time. I've been very busy, so I do apologize. Uh, but in this video, I've got over 100 slides of charts to share with you, just as many articles and other references, which I will put in the description below. Uh, we will touch on, on them. We're not going to go into detail on everything. Uh, but this video is likely to be done over a three or maybe even a four part series. Uh, a lot of insiders, we've been talking about this for some time. Some think it's due to that the increase in house prices recently is due to immigration. Uh, we have a lot of clients who feel the same thing. And so they've created their own FOMO. In this video, I'm going to argue why I totally dismiss that and why I do see a housing a downturn um, over the next several years and why I've put my money where my own mouth is and I've sold all my investment properties. I had six investment properties. I've sold them all. And so in this three or four part series, we'll see how long it goes for. I will share all the information that I've got, all my reasoning why uh, I see uh, big risks in the housing market and why I believe there's going to be a downturn. And it ultimately starts with the Austrian business cycle theory, which Ludwig von Mises created, Frederick Hayek received the Nobel Prize for, and at the end of the day, Austrians over the last hundred plus years have got a good track record when it comes to predicting every boom and bust. And so I think we need to start there, the Austrian business cycle theory, because that's the foundation of where all my theories and everything else uh, is built upon. So what I'll do is I'll cut to a clip, short clip that explains the Austrian business cycle theory. In one of the previous episodes, we discussed time preference and interest rates. If you have not seen it, watch it before you start this episode. Today we will discuss how dreadful crises arise. Interest rates play an important role as they coordinate production in time. You could say that the market interest rate is a price just as any other and that it balances supply and demand all the same. Market interest rate balances the supply of savings and save resources with the demand for loans and resources to be used for production. If the market participants raise the market interest rate, then it means that there isn't as much resources available as they previously thought. So now they have to pay a higher price if they want to use them. On the other hand, lowered market interest rate tells us that there is more saved resources available for investment. What is important is that the market interest rate, just as any other market price, merely expresses the existing market supply and demand, not the other way around. This means that the market interest rate only follows the market supply of savings and the demand for loans. When the central bank increases the money supply, it artificially lowers interest rates, but it does not immediately change the amount of saving on the market. There is a lot of new money to lend, but there are no new resources available to be bought for it. The demand for loans increases because they are now cheaper, but the supply of safe resources remains the same as before. After all, people didn't decide to consume less and save more. If they did, the raised supply of savings would lower the market interest rate instead of any such central bank intervention. Thus the central bank policy tricks entrepreneurs into thinking that there is more resources available for new investments than there really is. In so doing, the central bank disrupts the natural market coordination between consumption, saving and production, leaving the market participants with false information. The entrepreneurs now think that there is enough save resources to finish their present investments and reap the profits in the future. So there is a mismatch between the resources made available by saving and what producers think is available. 
Given this false information, the entrepreneurs are investing their money and resources in even longer term ventures than before, ones that wouldn't be profitable given higher interest rate. These businessmen thus start to hire more people, pay higher wages to acquire better workers and invest in new capital goods. Everyone is spending more and saving less. You might think, what could be wrong with that? People have jobs, new companies are established and the economy is doing great because people are spending more. Here's the problem. This situation is unsustainable and leads to erroneous investments or malinvestments as Ludwig von Mises called them. He illustrated this phenomenon by using a story about a master builder. A builder started constructing a house once thinking he had enough bricks, but in reality he had 20% less that he needed in order to finish the house. His design was not sustainable, but he was not aware of the fact. If he knew that he had fewer bricks, he would change his plans and build a smaller house or would wait to save enough bricks. However, he realized that he did not have enough bricks only after he started to run out of them. The house cannot be completed and all the work of the builder and his employees was wasted because now everything must have been demolished and redone. Of course, at the start of the construction, the economy seemed to be doing great because the builder and his workers had a job and we could all see the house being built. However, the eventual result was a waste of labor and other resources. It is important to note that the problem starts early, during the artificial boom or at the time that the builder had been making plans that were based on false information about the available resources. In the absence of sufficient prior savings, many projects simply cannot be completed, are not sufficiently profitable or there is no consumer demand for them. That is why during crisis we can see plenty of unused newly built airports and other brick projects, empty neighborhoods of newly built houses that no one wants to buy or bridges leading to nowhere. During the economic boom, resources are misused and malinvested, leading to their consumption and waste. This means that they are not used properly at the present and won't be able to be used so in the future, thus leaving us with a lower future standard of living. What is the bust then? The boom cannot last forever and at some point it has to go bust. The interest rates have to go up eventually. When the time comes, the entrepreneurs will realize that the investments they made are unsustainable. They will start to cut costs, fire people and otherwise liquidate the investments. Look at it this way. Artificially cheap credit is like a drug for a drug addict. The drug makes the addict feel great for a while, but the feeling doesn't last. The economic downturn after an artificial boom is just like that. It's the way to detoxicate after taking the poison of cheap loans. And of course it is painful and unpleasant, but it's eventually healthy. It's a sign that the market is working to remove the poison of malinvestments, so that it can begin to function normally. Unfortunately, in recent times when the crash comes, governments and central banks do not allow for this detox and treat the problem by giving the drug addict another dose of the drug. So they start to lower the rates again and to inject cheap credit into the banking system. This of course is not a healthy nor sustainable process. The Austrian business cycle theory presented here was developed by Ludwig von Mises and then by F.A. Hayek, who won a Nobel Prize for his work. So you can see from that why I'm also bearish China. Building stuff to nowhere. Uh, also, we saw what I believe to be the beginning of the Austrian business cycle theory uh, play out in a big way in 2020, where central banks and governments um, artificially lowering interest rates, pumping cheap cash out, and people uh, over-invested. And in 2020, I called in Australia uh, the building bust, which is what we've seen. We had builders moving downstairs in our building. They didn't come back this year. They went bust in December, in Christmas uh, last year. We called that in 2020. Pretty easy, based on the Austrian business cycle theory. 
So how does the Austrian business cycle theory work in practice? What's an example? Uh, well, we can look at leading up to the global financial crisis. And remember that it wasn't the financial crisis that caused house prices to fall. It was house prices falling that caused the financial crisis, which could very well repeat itself. One of the reasons that Austrian economics has seen increasing attention from intellectuals since 2007 is its relevance for understanding the housing boom and bust and subsequent recession. Specifically, the Austrian theory of the business cycle forms the core of that explanation. When the Austrian theory of the cycle is combined with an analysis of US housing policy during the decade or two leading up to the housing crash, it provides a powerful explanation of what happened and why. Austrians argue in short, that the Federal Reserve's artificial lowering of interest rates to credit expansion after 2001 created an incentive to invest in long-term assets, and U.S. government housing policy directed that credit into the housing market. Because the lower interest rates did not reflect the real saving behavior of the public, the investments in housing were ultimately unsustainable, leading eventually to the housing crisis. When housing prices fell, all of the other financial assets whose value was premised on rising housing prices saw their values fall as well, precipitating the financial crisis. The responses of the Bush and Obama administrations to the crisis in the fall of 2008 and spring of 2009, as well as other policy failures by the Fed, exacerbated and lengthened the resulting recession. To understand the Austrian theory of the business cycle, we need to understand a little bit about what it is that interest rates do. Interest rates ensure the intertemporal coordination of savers and borrowers. When people want to save more, that expands the quantity of loanable funds available to borrowers and lowers interest rates. In a properly functioning economy, more savings by the public, and low, meaning lower interest rates to borrowers, means that those borrowers can now take that, those funds and invest them in capital goods and expand production. They can also take their time and engage in longer term structures of production because people are more willing to save and therefore more willing to wait for those outputs for later on. In a properly functioning economy, the interest rate coordinates this behavior between borrowers and lenders. What the Austrian theory of the business cycle describes is a situation where the interest rate fails to perform that function because credit expansion by the central bank has created a false interest rate signal. So after 2001, the excess credit creation by the Fed gave banks additional funds to lend, leading them to lower interest rates, but that wasn't because the public was more willing to save. In fact, the Fed's credit expansion was so great that it caused for 18 months the federal funds rate, which is the rate banks charge each other to borrow and lend, to actually be negative if one accounts for inflation. This is a huge incentive to borrow and to borrow in the absence of real saving to support it. People didn't want to lend, nor did they want to wait for the outputs that the borrowed funds would produce. This situation is unsustainable. The real resources to create the project that the borrowers are beginning to construct simply did not exist. It has to eventually collapse. That's the boom and the bust of the Austrian business cycle. But why was it in the housing market in this particular circumstance? Government policy made housing artificially attractive. In general, the lower interest rates the Fed created make housing look like a better deal. Historically, Austrian economists had argued that during the business cycle boom, the excess funds and the lower interest rate generate increased investment in sort of the productive capital that firms purchase. But in this particular case, it ended up in housing thanks to the policies of the US government. And like those capital goods, housing is interest rate sensitive. So it would make sense that this was one possible way that the Austrian business cycle could take place. So why was housing so attractive? Well, for one thing is the secondary mortgage market. In particular, the existence of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the government sponsored enterprises. Those two institutions are not bound by a profit constraint and everyone understood that they would get bailed out if they would fail. What happened was as mortgage originators created mortgages, they could sell those off in the secondary market and Fannie and Freddie would buy them up, reducing the risk to those mortgage originators. This made housing look particularly attractive and enabled those originators to create mortgages on very thin paper from borrowers. Other government policy included the push for affordable housing. 
government mandates on Freddie and Fannie and other borrowers to ensure that both minority borrowers and borrowers with lower incomes were better able to get housing made, once again, housing look more attractive. And then all of the financial instruments that were created that were based on rising housing prices became part of this problem as well. Eventually, the lack of real resources to support the new houses that were being built became clear, and the sell-off of houses began in 2006, eventually causing the whole house of cards to fall. One key Austrian insight here is that once that crash and once the recession begins, the best policy is to let the economy adjust to the new reality. The boom is where the mistakes are made. The bust is when those mistakes have to be corrected. Resources were badly misallocated in the boom. We had too many people building too many houses. And that was the result of the key price, the interest rate, that was not accurately reflecting the public's knowledge and preferences. The only way to get resources reallocated better is to allow true market prices to guide entrepreneurs in figuring out where best to use those resources. The various policies that were intended to combat the crisis and recession, especially the bailouts of the banking system, prevented entrepreneurs and markets from making the necessary adjustments to the use of resources, which deepened and prolonged the recession. If one wants an analogy here, one can think about getting drunk and then having a hangover the next morning. When one wakes up with a hangover, one feels terrible, not because you made mistakes that morning that made you feel bad, but rather the hangover is the result of the poor decisions you made the night before. That feeling sick during a hangover is your body's way of correcting the mistakes you made while you were drinking. And the best course of action is to let nature take its course and to allow time to heal. That's the same advice that Austrians give when it comes to recessions in the marketplace. Allow markets and entrepreneurs to reallocate resources to where they need to be. The Austrian analysis of the Great Recession makes use of a variety of the school's insights, from the macroeconomics of its business cycle theory, to its analysis of the failures of regulation, to its understanding of the price system, to its theory of entrepreneurship. And this is one reason why Austrian economics is back in the intellectual conversation since 2007. So you guys know that I also don't subscribe to the theory that banks are simply intermediaries uh, where they receive deposits and then they lend those deposits out. I subscribe to uh, Professor Richard Werner's uh, theory that banks buy assets. So when you um, apply for a loan, whether it's for a car or a house or whatever, um, you create a bond and the bank simply purchases that asset and so they just credit new currency into your account so what i'd suggest you guys do is just google or youtube uh professor werner this is a wonderful little 15 minute interview that he does i highly recommend it and if you can find this presentation that he did uh, some years ago uh, the three theories of banking. I highly recommend you guys watch that as well. So now you guys have a better understanding of what the Austrian business cycle theory is, how it works and how it works in the real world. Um, we might leave it here for part one, where part two, we'll start getting into all the slides, all the charts, all the data, all the information, and we can go from there. Thanks for listening. And I will see you in the next video. And just a reminder, the information provided in this video is for education and entertainment purposes only. Nothing on this channel constitutes as financial advice. The information in this presentation is no substitute for financial advice, and all investors should seek advice from a licensed financial advisor having regard to your own objectives, financial situation, and needs.